20-year-old Chad Langford, a specialist in the United States Army, was working routine patrol with the military police at the Redstone Arsenal, a massive army base just outside of Huntsville, Alabama. Just after 8 p.m. on Thursday, March 12, 1992, Langford radioed back to the MP station that he was going to investigate a stalled vehicle near the Civilian Recreation Center on the base's southern edge nearby to the Tennessee River. He then went silent. Fifteen minutes later, MPs searching for Chad found him lying on the ground near his cruiser along a gravel road. A cord was wrapped around his ankles, another around his neck. His cap had been stuffed into his mouth, a handcuff locked on his left wrist. Chad had sustained a lethal gunshot to his right temple and was bleeding out. Ninety minutes later, he died while surgeons struggled to save his life. Despite the strange scene, the call of a stalled vehicle, items missing from Chad's body, and the condition he had been found in, less than 48 hours later, the army ruled that Chad had been the victim of a suicide. A psychological examination of the soldier, conducted in the weeks after his death, determined that he'd spent months crafting the plan to end his own life while making it appear as though he'd been the victim of a homicide. It didn't take long for cracks to begin showing. Vital evidence had been ignored. Forensic testing called into question whether or not Chad had even fired a weapon that night. And despite evidence to the contrary, the army denied the presence of any other cars in the area. Chad's family never believed that he would have taken his own life, arguing that he had operated as an undercover narcotics officer and had recently become frightened that his identity would be revealed, putting his life in danger. The army denied that Chad had ever worked as an undercover and stated that no evidence had been found to suggest this was anything other than a tragic case of suicide. The full scope of the evidence, however, tells a very different story. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 184, The Mysterious Death of Chad Langford. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the mysterious death of Chad Langford, a case which has fascinated and disturbed me since I first learned about it nearly 25 years ago. Before getting into the case, Just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash traceevidence or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. 20-year-old Chad Langford had always wanted to join the military. Three years into his service, he was transferred to Alabama where he joined the military police. Less than a year later, he would die while on duty, and now, nearly 30 years later, what exactly happened that cold Thursday night in March of 1992 has never been fully explained. This is episode 184, The Mysterious Death of Chad Langford. Adjacent to Huntsville, Alabama sits the Redstone Arsenal a sprawling army base covering nearly 2,000 acres and home to operations carried out by the Department of Defense, Department of Justice, NASA, and the Army Missile Command. Military police patrol the base, which is also home to nearly 40,000 government contractors and personnel. Highly secure, few dangerous incidents have happened throughout the base's 80-year history, but on a quiet Thursday night in 1992, that record of safety was forever changed. A radio dispatcher sitting in the MP station received a transmission from Specialist Chad Langford. Langford relayed that while on patrol, he'd come upon a stalled vehicle and was going to investigate. Moments later, a garbled message of static came across the radio and then went silent. Attempts to get a response from Langford went unanswered, 
prompting all on-duty MPs to begin searching for the 20-year-old. No more than 15 minutes passed before Chad was found lying on the ground, bleeding from a gunshot wound to the head. His legs were bound with a cord. A wire was curled around his neck. His cap was folded and stuffed into his mouth. His handcuffs were latched onto his left wrist. His MP armband, radio, and badge were missing, later to be found a quarter mile away. In the weeks leading up to his death, Chad had told family and friends that he was scared for his life. He'd been working as an undercover narcotics officer, and were his identity to be revealed, he'd become a target for murder for multiple people. Yet just 48 hours later, before any forensics reports had been finalized, the Army classified Chad's death to be a suicide, one which they argued he'd elaborately arranged to appear as though he'd been murdered in the line of duty. Chad's family vehemently argued against this ruling, but the Army stood by it, arguing that a controversial procedure known as a psychological autopsy had shown that Chad had never worked undercover, had a history of psychological and personal problems, and was veering into criminal behavior in his off time. Further investigation, however, would begin to pull apart this finely crafted narrative, raising questions which nearly 30 years later have never been answered. Had Chad planned for months to pull off this strange scenario in order to make a suicide look like a murder? Or was it possible that the army had leapt to their conclusion, ignoring all evidence to the contrary? Chad Wayne Langford was born on Friday, July 2, 1971, to parents James and Joanne in Nueces County, Texas. Chad was the only child born to the couple who, shortly after his birth, moved from Texas to California, where James had been born and raised. The couple settled in James's native Elk Creek, a small census-designated area just over 100 miles north of Sacramento. Described as a bright, adventurous, and affectionate child, Chad would spend the first years of his life being raised by his parents. But in March of 1975, four months before his fourth birthday, the family would break apart with his parents divorcing. Following the separation, it appears that Chad's mother moved back to Texas while his father maintained custody, raising the young boy with the assistance of his mother, Marie. Chad developed a close relationship with his grandmother, who became like a second mother to him, and the two spent a lot of time together. By all accounts, Chad had a happy childhood, exploring the outdoors with friends and performing well in school. As many children do, he quickly developed an interest in sports, predominantly baseball and football. Chad continued his pursuit of sports while attending Elk Creek High School, a school known for providing amazing one-on-one -on -one instruction due to its extremely slim student body. The school, which houses grades 7 through 12, averages just 8 students per class, and in the 1980s had only 9 teachers. In 1988, when Chad was a junior, he was quoted in an article about the school where he explained that he loved the small class sizes and direct interaction and attention, comparing the faculty to being more like private tutors. Despite being the smallest public school in the state, Elk Creek still fielded an 11-player football team as well as other varsity and junior sports teams. In his senior year of 1989, Chad was a pitcher on the baseball team and also played as an offensive lineman and linebacker on the football team. Several articles throughout the year note Chad as being one of the better performing players who seemed to have a natural athletic skill. He had a formidable build, standing 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighing 185 pounds when he joined the South Team roster for the District All-Star Game, wearing number 66. While Chad's interest in athletics were a constant in his life, he didn't see his skills leading him much beyond high school, but he had a different future in mind. For years, Chad had admired the military and envisioned himself making a career out of it. Shortly after graduating, Chad decided to move forward and make that dream a reality, enlisting in the Army at the age of 18. After completing basic training, Chad was shipped overseas where he was stationed in Camp Casey in South Korea. While little is known about Chad's first years in the Army, we know that he received multiple commendations and earned the Good Conduct Medal, awarded to soldiers who display exemplary behavior, efficiency, and fidelity in military service. Records released by the Army would later show that Chad's commanding officers thought highly of him, 
and he was referred to more than once as the model soldier. In the summer of 1991, Chad's time in South Korea came to an end, and he was shipped back to the United States where he would take on a new role. Arriving in Alabama, Chad joined the military police and was assigned to a post at Redstone Arsenal, the military installation covering more than 38,000 acres in Madison County. Over the years, Redstone has taken on different shapes and forms and has been utilized by the Department of Defense, Department of Justice, and NASA. Constructed in 1941, Redstone was originally designated to create a chemical weapons facility. Broken up into three sections, the Huntsville Arsenal and Depot were overseen by the Chemical Warfare Service, while the Redstone Ordnance Plant was controlled by the Army Ordnance Department. Over the years, the post would continue to grow, bringing on government and contractor workforces averaging nearly 40,000 personnel today. If you're listening through the Vodacast app, you can see the Redstone Arsenal now. The link is in the show notes. In June of 1991, one month before he turned 20 years old, Chad arrived at Redstone, which during that time was operating as part of the U.S. Army Missile Command. Chad had received the rank of specialist, which had previously allowed him to be a platoon leader, but in Alabama, he would have to go through the rigorous training necessary for him to earn his position as a member of the military police. According to his father, Jim, Chad began considering the possibility of leaving the Army when his term was up, perhaps to attend school in pursuit of a career in law enforcement. By December of 91, however, he had decided that he wanted to stick with the military, making it clear that he fully intended to re-enlist. Unfortunately, he would never get that chance, as he would be found mortally wounded while on duty just a few months later. On the evening of Thursday, March 12, 1992, Chad was scheduled to be on patrol at Redstone from the early afternoon until 11.30 p.m. At least for the first few hours of his shift, Chad wouldn't be working alone, as another MP would join him in their patrol vehicle until 6 p.m., after which time Chad would be out on his own. Interviewed later, this other MP described Chad that night as joking around and seeming to be in an upbeat mood. As 6 p.m. approached, Chad and his partner made their way back to the MP station so his partner could be relieved of duty. According to another MP at the station, when Chad was about to head out on his own, he was told not to stray too far from the base proper and to specifically avoid the southern region which runs along the banks of the Tennessee River. Reportedly, this order was given because patrolling that far out would delay the response of backup should a dangerous situation arrive. The first two hours of Chad's solo patrol went on without incident, with him radioing in on the regular to update the station of his whereabouts. For a time, it seemed, it would be another slow night working patrol, but all of that would change in Chad's third hour. For reasons never revealed, if indeed they are known, Chad disregarded the information previously given to him, and at approximately 8 p.m. he made his way to the southeastern section of Redstone, where there's a recreational area accessible to civilians, approximately five miles north of the Tennessee River. Army reports state that it was around this time that Chad exited his patrol cruiser and used a payphone at the rec center. Reportedly, Chad called a female student he'd been dating on and off at her dorm at the campus of Alabama A&M University. The two spoke for a short period of time to confirm plans to go out later together that night, with Chad telling the woman he would see her in just over three hours around 11.30. This woman, later interviewed by military investigators, stated that there hadn't been anything unusual about their conversation, and she described Chad as talking normal without any hint that he was concerned or worried about anything in particular, and in fact, he seemed excited about getting together later. It's never been revealed exactly how long Chad was on the phone, nor what time the call was made, but Army reports seem to confirm that, as his procedure, Chad radioed into the station notifying them of his location around this same time, stating that he was at the rec center. The final call from Chad came across the radio at 8.07 p.m. According to the Army, Chad called into the station and informed them that he'd come across a stalled vehicle and was going to investigate. Strangely, though, he did not follow procedure in this instance, which required him to report his exact location, the make and model of the vehicle, the license plate number, and a description of any occupants. 
Whether this was overlooked due to Chad's casual belief that it was merely someone who was having car trouble, or perhaps for some other reason, has never been determined. Officially, the Army wrote in their reports that this was Chad's final radio transmission, however, there are some who disagree. Several MPs later told investigators that a second call came over the band, but they couldn't make out anything that had been said, describing the call as being broken up and garbled. According to the Huntsville Times, after several minutes, the dispatcher attempted to get Chad to answer, as he hadn't checked in since his last call. Worried that something was wrong, as multiple transmissions were sent out without a response from Chad, all available MPs were notified of the situation and directed to begin searching for him. The radio dispatcher, who had been trying to get in touch with Chad, also joined in the search, leaving his post. Knowing that Chad had last reported being near the recreational area, several MPs began making their way to the southeastern section of Redstone. At 8.20 p.m., just 13 minutes after Chad's last radio message, one MP came upon his patrol vehicle on a remote gravel road. Chad's cruiser was parked, with its driver's side door hanging open, hazard lights flashing, and engine running. Climbing from his vehicle, the MP approached Chad's cruiser, at which time he spotted the 20-year-old lying on the road in a growing pool of blood. The MP quickly radioed the location at which he'd found Chad and requested paramedics before rushing towards the fallen soldier. According to military records, Chad was found lying in the road, though the exact position has been somewhat debated. Early reports state that Chad was lying on the ground just to the side of the vehicle, almost under the open driver's side door. Later accounts, however, say that Chad had been found to the rear of the vehicle near some old World War II-era bunkers. The exact location in which Chad was found, however, is the least debated detail about the scene. According to early reports, when found, Chad was lying on his back and bleeding from a gunshot wound to the head. His own 45 caliber gun issued by the Army was missing from its holster and would be discovered lying beneath his left shoulder. The shoulder cord for Chad's gun was looped around his ankles and knotted. A wire from the radar unit in the cruiser had been removed from the vehicle and loosely wrapped around his neck. While Chad's right hand was free, his own handcuffs were locked onto his left wrist with the right cuff unattached. Clutched in Chad's left hand, MPs found a set of keys among which was the key to the cuffs. The microphone to the radio inside the cruiser was stretched and dangling from the open driver's side door while Chad's blood-stained cap had been stuffed into his mouth. The first MP at the scene assumed that Chad had been involved in some kind of an altercation that resulted in him being bound and shot. Other evidence added confusion, however. Chad's MP armband, badge, and walkie-talkie were missing. These three items would later be discovered approximately a quarter mile from the scene near the entrance to the recreation area. According to multiple reports, these items had been neatly placed and arranged in the middle of the road. The armband, which is typically pinned to the uniform, showed no signs of tears or a struggle, as if it had been carefully removed and then placed in the road. How that made sense with Chad being overpowered by an assailant, no one could be sure. Upon arrival, paramedics discovered that Chad still had a pulse and they began life-saving procedures as they prepped him for transfer. The 20-year-old was quickly rushed to Huntsville Hospital just under six miles away. Tragically, despite their efforts, surgeons were unable to revive Chad and he passed away 90 minutes later after being found at approximately 9.50 p.m. After being notified of his death, an MP present at the hospital wrapped Chad's hands in plastic to preserve them for gunpowder residue testing to determine whether or not he had fired his sidearm that night. Chad's body was removed from the hospital and transferred to Fox Army Health Center for examination. An autopsy was conducted on the 20-year-old and revealed several confusing details. Doctors determined that Chad had died of a single gunshot wound which struck in the area of his right temple. The lethal shot, according to the report, had been fired from point-blank range. According to investigators, at the time of the autopsy, they had not yet located the bullet which had killed Chad. The official autopsy report noted they had found no signs of assault or anything suggesting a struggle had taken place, saying that Chad did not have any bruises or marks which would suggest he'd been involved in any physical altercations. 
During the procedure, the medical examiner discovered writing on Chad's left hand. Though they couldn't fully make it out, they believed it read M-A-R-03. And then the name Robert, or perhaps Roberta. What this meant to this day, no one is certain. Toxicology reports showed no traces of alcohol or drugs in Chad's system at the time of his death, and overall it was determined that he had been healthy and in shape when he died. Gunpowder residue tests conducted on Chad's hands were unable to confirm whether or not he had fired his gun that night, with reports stating he either did not fire the weapon, or if he did, minimal amounts of gunpowder had been deposited on his hands, certainly not enough to confirm that he had in fact fired any shots. This added to an already confusing situation as examination of Chad's sidearm showed that two rounds had been fired the night he died, and investigators found the spent shells near his body. This discrepancy, however, was only the first of several that would be discovered. In addition to the absence of gunpowder, a forensic examination conducted on the gun failed to show either Chad's finger or palm prints on the weapon. There was, however, an unidentified white residue found on the gun near the trigger. The source of this residue could not be determined, though testing was able to confirm that it did not match the white paint from Chad's vehicle, a Chevy Lumina. Strangely, while ballistic tests were conducted showing that the two shells had indeed been fired from Chad's weapon, no test was ever run to prove whether or not the bullet which had killed Chad had actually come from his own weapon. Suffice it to say, investigators were uncertain what exactly had occurred with conflicting evidence between the scene, the gun, and Chad's autopsy. On Sunday, March 15th, three days later, Arsenal spokesman David Harris told reporters that Chad had been shot and killed while on duty and that an investigation to determine what happened was ongoing. This made Chad the first military police officer who had ever been killed in the then 40-year history of Redstone Arsenal. At the time, a lot of rumors were circulating that Chad had been tied up and executed, though Harris would not comment on this, saying only that Chad's weapon had been drawn though he wouldn't discuss whether it had been fired nor whether it was the weapon that killed the 20-year-old. The Huntsville Times ran a story in which an anonymous source on the base reported that, when they found Chad, both of his hands had been cuffed behind his back. When asked about this, Harris would only reply, quote, We're looking at every possibility, from suicide to homicide, end quote. This information would later change, with a declaration that Chad had likely committed suicide as all other possibilities had been ruled out. Chad's remains were transferred to Elk Creek, where a funeral and chapel service were arranged to take place on Tuesday, March 17th. Jim was absolutely devastated when he was notified about his son's death, and like many, assumed that the MP had been killed in the line of duty. Investigators at the time weren't able to give the grieving father very much information as they were still working to figure out what exactly had occurred. Just the next day, though, investigators would release information which completely shocked Chad's friends and family. According to their investigation, the Army reported that they had ruled out homicide as a possibility and were ruling Chad's death to be a suicide. A report released by the Army Missile Command explained, quote, There were no indications of a struggle or that other persons had been on the scene prior to the arrival of MPs, and there were no indications of another vehicle having been present at the scene. End quote. In order to support their ruling, the Army conducted what is known as a psychological autopsy, which involves interviewing people who knew Chad as well as reviewing his service record for any signs that he may have been considering taking his own life. Ultimately, they ruled that Chad had become frustrated with Army life and had openly criticized fellow soldiers at Redstone, saying they were of poor quality. In addition to this, they explained that Chad had struggled with rejection throughout much of his life and had an inferiority complex. One incident they claimed as being detrimental to his mental health occurred when Chad had asked his girlfriend to marry him and she turned him down. The report explains that the girlfriend broke up with Chad, devastating him. According to the psychologist, Chad felt lost and had no one to turn to to discuss his issues or to seek refuge. Jim, however, disagreed, noting that his son called him frequently and always discussed any issues he was having. He knew he could call his father if he needed someone to talk to, so for him, that simply didn't make sense. In regard to Chad's girlfriend, 
that story didn't make sense either. Chad had been dating a woman named Roxanne for several months prior to his death, but according to her, things did not end the way the report said they had. She acknowledged that she had in fact rejected Chad's first proposal, but she accepted the second time. When the relationship ended, it wasn't by her choice, but a decision Chad made himself. According to Roxanne, she arrived at Chad's barracks for a planned date to go see a movie approximately a month before his death. The two were talking while Chad got ready when everything suddenly changed. Roxanne explained to the Huntsville Times, quote, Out of the blue, he just told me to leave. He was angry. He said I had to go and that he couldn't see me anymore because of his job. I didn't understand. Just the week before, he had taken me shopping for an engagement ring. The day before, things were fine. He had tears in his eyes. He kept telling me how sorry he was, but that I had to get out. I asked him what was wrong with him, and he kept saying it was his job. He said it was going to take a lot of time. I knew then, by the look on his face, that he was involved in something that he didn't want to be involved in. End quote. Perhaps most curiously, Roxanne stated that when interviewed during Chad's so-called psychological autopsy, she had told the investigator this entire story, yet it was still written that she had broken up with him. Jim later told the Times that the Army had also reported to him that Roxanne had broken up with Chad, though when he spoke to her, she relayed the same story, that Chad had ended things due to something to do with his job. Regardless, the Army CID ruled that Chad had been despondent for months and hadn't taken his own life on a whim. Instead, they argued, he had planned it out for months. When word of Roxanne's conflicting story came out in the press, the Army merely adjusted their stance, arguing that Chad had broken up with her in order to distance himself as he was planning on taking his own life. As for the scene that night, according to the Army, Chad had carefully planned things out, wanting to make his suicide look as though he'd been killed in the line of duty. This was obviously difficult for Jim to accept, let alone anyone who knew and cared for Chad. The details didn't make any sense, and friends and family began believing one of two possibilities. That the Army had simply rushed the investigation and hadn't done a thorough job, or maybe they were covering up for someone, perhaps a person in a higher position of authority. According to Jim, his son had told him in the weeks leading up to his death that he was scared for his life due to an undercover assignment he'd been working on. Jim went on to explain that two months before the shooting, Chad had told him he was working as an undercover drug investigator focused on neighborhoods surrounding Redstone. This assignment was dangerous, and according to Chad, it was vital that he keep his identity a secret. On Monday, March 2nd, 10 days before his death, Jim spoke to Chad on the phone and found his son was very worried for his safety. Reportedly, Chad told his father he believed someone was going to reveal his identity to those he was working with. Jim explained, quote, Chad said if the people he was investigating found out that he was an MP, he was dead. He said he was afraid someone was about to find him out. He told me that the people he was dealing with were very, very bad, and that he was scared and was involved in something he couldn't get out of. End quote. Arsenal spokesman David Harris denied that Chad was working any undercover operation, saying they'd found no evidence to support it. Harris explained, quote, His work involved patrol and traffic enforcement. While on duty, he wore an army uniform and an armband that clearly identified him as a military policeman, end quote. According to investigators, due to Chad's frustration with military life and his own issues with rejection, he often made up stories to make himself sound more important. They argued that Chad had likely told friends and family that he was working an important undercover operation, but in truth, there were no facts to support his story. Beyond that, the Army would go on to say that while Chad had been a model soldier, his off-duty behaviors had raised several concerning issues. Firstly, it was noted that in the months leading up to his death, Chad had changed his social situation and was hanging out with known criminals and troublemakers. He also changed his style, wearing only dark-colored clothing and getting his ear pierced. Their report stated that Chad had become a suspect in a series of car break-ins and that on one occasion, the Huntsville police had questioned him about this. 
According to the Army, Chad was sighted sitting in a parked car late at night near some other cars, and when police asked him what he was doing, he was unable to supply them with an answer. In the backseat of his vehicle, they found a rifle. Though, because Chad had no criminal record and worked at the base, he was not accused of any crimes at that time. The official report also stated that Chad had acquired several firearms in the months leading up to his death. These included the aforementioned rifle, a 25 caliber, as well as a 9mm handgun and a 25 caliber pistol. In addition to this, the Army stated that Chad was the alleged ringleader of a plot to rob an Army escort. Statements given by one MP and two soldiers claimed that Chad had attempted to convince them to go along with his plan, which would involve the theft of $30,000. According to the soldiers, the escort carrying the money would be shot, and Chad, wearing a bulletproof vest, would also be shot to make it appear that he had attempted to stop the robbery. The alleged plan was to be carried out on Thursday, February 6th, but was delayed and rescheduled for the 13th, less than a month before Chad's death. The soldiers claimed that they told Chad they had decided not to go through with the crime, though none of the three reported this to authorities at the time. Reportedly, following Chad's death, none of the three soldiers faced any charges for their involvement in a criminal plot due to a lack of evidence, which seems odd since they are in fact the ones who gave the statements about it in the first place. Asked about this later, Harris told the Huntsville Times, quote, All three are no longer in the Army. Two were administratively eliminated. A third was near the end of his enlistment and subsequently left the Army. End quote. Hearing all of this information was extremely upsetting for Jim, who argued that there had to be some kind of a cover-up going on, believing that his son was telling him the truth about the undercover operation. According to Jim, if nothing else, this additional information only worked to strengthen that belief, as he felt Chad had begun hanging out with questionable people and dressing differently in order to fit in while working undercover. He also believed that Chad's purchase of three guns were due to his fear for his safety, as he had said he was working with very dangerous people. As for the alleged robbery plot, this was the first Jim had heard of it, and he found it hard to accept that only after his death did these soldiers find it necessary to come forward. Many began to wonder if perhaps one or all of the soldiers had played a role in Chad's death and were merely covering for themselves by pinning everything to a soldier who could no longer defend himself. As for his son planning out an elaborate suicide in an attempt to make it look as though he'd been the victim of a murder, Jim struggled to rationalize that telling the Times, quote, Don't you think Chad knew you would investigate it and that we would find out? They said he was young and that they didn't think he thought that far ahead or realized the extent of their investigations, end quote. Strangely, Chad didn't think far enough ahead to know that his death would be investigated, but according to the Army, he did plan far enough ahead to have planned out his suicide for months. This was a case full of contradictions and hearsay, but little hard evidence supported any particular theory. Jim had his own questions about the night his son died, and for their part, the Army lacked answers. Jim wanted to know about the vehicle his son had stopped that night, the one he'd called in over the radio. The Army argued Chad hadn't stopped anyone, and the story was a cover to buy himself time away from the radio. According to friends of Chad's, the soldier had been very frightened in his last weeks and told him that he'd been threatened by gang members and had been shot at while driving along Interstate 565. Several people in Chad's life reported that he'd received threatening notes, with one woman telling investigators that she had seen one of these notes in his barracks. The Army claimed they had no evidence of any threats against Chad, nor had any notes been found amongst his belongings. Beyond these questions, Jim also wondered why, if he was planning to take his own life, Chad had continued making plans for later that night as well as the future. According to the Army report, Chad had been seeing two women who were students at Alabama A&M University, 10 miles north of Arsenal. The night he died, Chad invited one of those women to visit him at work, though she ultimately had to back out, while he made plans to go out with the other after he got off work. According to another soldier who was friends with Chad, he called him that same night just to check in on him and see how he was doing, and the two arranged to get together in the next weeks. Roxanne had also had an encounter with Chad that seemed to suggest he wasn't planning on taking his life. She told investigators that on Saturday, March 7th, 
she ran into Chad at the enlisted members club. The two chatted for a bit, and according to Roxanne, Chad told her they might be able to date again soon. She explained, quote, He said he couldn't set a date for us to go out, because his job still wouldn't permit him to, but he said he would love to go out and would call me. Then he left with those guys to go to Alabama A&M. That's the last time I saw him. End quote. As it turns out, the night he died, Chad did call Roxanne and left her a message saying, quote, Hey, Roxanne, just called to see how you're doing. I'll call you back later. End quote. The Army, however, wrote these calls off saying that Chad was saying goodbye to those he cared about. Were this the case, though, why would Chad call two women he was seeing off and on and a fellow soldier and his ex-girlfriend, but not his father or grandmother, arguably two of the most important people in his life? Unfortunately, it seemed, no matter what anyone else thought, the Army wasn't planning on changing its ruling. Seven long months passed with the Army refusing to budge until October, when a second investigation was launched. Called a line of duty investigation, spokesman Harris explained that while the CID had been charged with determining what had happened, the line of duty investigation was necessary as Chad had died while on duty. Their job, however, was not to determine what had happened, but instead whether or not it had happened as the result of the usual performance of Chad's duties. The second investigation would raise additional questions about Chad's death, which call into question the original ruling. According to the line of duty report, there were many discrepancies between what the Army had reported initially and what additional investigators had found. Firstly, MPs did in fact stop a vehicle in the vicinity of where Chad was shot that night, despite the fact that their report stated no one had been stopped. According to the report, MP sent out a radio transmission to notify all units they had found Chad wounded at approximately 8.20 p.m. Just 10 minutes later at 8.30, military police pulled over the driver of a white car along Buxton Road, less than two miles from where Chad had been shot. The second report shows that upon stopping this vehicle, MPs identified the driver as a civilian employee of the arsenal. Asked what he was doing in the area, the man told military police that he had had an argument with his wife and was just taking a drive to let off some steam. For reasons no one can understand, MPs did not record the make and model of the vehicle, nor did they take down the license plate number. They did, however, confiscate the driver's ID badge, which was brought back to the MP station. Curiously, though, no one wrote down the man's name, and when he'd arrived the next day to pick up his ID, it was given to him without any questions or reports being filed. Ten minutes after a soldier has been shot, they stop this guy in the area, but no one thinks it's important enough to keep a record of who he was, nor did he face any additional questioning. The line of duty report addresses this saying, quote, This is the first piece of information in this investigation that raises questions concerning physical evidence. End quote. It was later stated that the MP who had stopped the car was the radio dispatcher and that he asked the driver if he'd seen any MPs in the area that night, to which the driver said no. Reportedly, at least one MP told investigators that he believed the driver of the white car worked part time at a local Taco Bell. Another MP, a friend of Chad's, also told investigators that just three days prior to his death, he and Chad had gone to a Taco Bell on University Drive. This MP claimed that Chad began talking to someone there, asking where he could find another employee who owed him money. Spokesman Harris told the Times that while they tried to track down this person, they were never able to do so. This could have been highly important as white residue found on Chad's gun has never been compared to the white vehicle stopped that night. The line of duty report also focused in on the lack of gunpowder residue on Chad's hands, noting, quote, The evidence does not confirm that Langford shot his own weapon or that he was killed by a forty-five caliber bullet fired from his own weapon. Gunshot residue samples taken from Langford's hands did not determine this conclusively, end quote. Asked about this later, Harris said it's not unusual for gunpowder residue to be inconclusive. In addition to this, the report states that while Chad's fingerprints and palm prints were not found on his gun, 
There were, in fact, unidentified fingerprints and fibers discovered on his MP armband, radio, and badge, all of which had been found in the street a quarter mile from the scene of the shooting. For some reason, investigators only compared these prints to Chad and the first MP who arrived on the scene. They remain unidentified to this day. A legal pad found in Chad's car had some indentations showing that he had written something on a page which was no longer in the pad. Using different light sources, lab technicians recovered different words and numbers which had been written. These included pool tarring, 817, 287 4300, 287 Motor, Lang, Chad, and Sonia. The meaning behind this has never been determined, and whether or not it has anything to do with Chad's death is unknown. Forensics tests regarding Chad's cause of death also raised some concerns. It was determined that the bullet which had killed Chad had been fired from no more than 30 inches above the ground, suggesting that he was on his knees when shot. The Army had ruled that Chad had to have fired the lethal bullet himself since at just 30 inches off the ground, a second shooter would have to have been lying on the ground to shoot him at such a sharp angle. While the Army CID report concluded suicide, the line of duty report notes that they can't make a conclusion on the cause of death due to a lack of available evidence, going on to say, quote, exact information concerning the period prior to death is hampered by a lack of substantial evidence, end quote. While this second report was vastly more thorough than the first, it answered less questions than it raised. Following the issuance of the report, both Jim and Chad's mother received $51,000 each, splitting his life insurance policy. Jim took this as supporting his belief that this had to have been something other than a suicide, telling the Times, quote, When I got the line of duty report, I felt like someone else had recognized some of the flaws that I have with this investigation. Somebody besides this boy's father is seeing it. I think all this proves that the Army really does not know what happened to Chad. For me to have gotten that money, I think, means that his death is still undetermined. Don't brand this boy until all the facts are known. There is no proof of what happened to him. End quote. Military sources, I should note, told the Times that it's not unusual for the servicemen's group life insurance to pay out death benefits even in the cases of suicide. Two months later in December, Unsolved Mysteries agreed to run a segment on Chad's case and began interviewing family and friends, as well as the Army spokesman. Richard Ross, the director of the episode, who also wrote the script for Chad's segment, spoke to reporters about agreeing to do the case. Asked why they believed it merited coverage, Ross explained, quote, Chad Langford's family and friends do not buy the suicide theory, and we believe the circumstances surrounding his death are very unusual. This is a credible story. The people who believe he met with foul play are very credible. They paint a very different picture than the army does. End quote. If you're listening through Vodacast, you can see this episode of Unsolved Mysteries now. The link is in the show notes. Whether it was done in an attempt to get to the bottom of things, or was just a full-blown situation of cover your ass, just days after Unsolved Mysteries began working on Chad's case, the Army launched a third investigation into his death. Reportedly, this investigation came as the result of new information given to investigators by an unnamed source who alleged that Chad had been murdered by a drug dealer to whom he owed a large sum of money. Hoping to get more people to come forward with what they knew, Jim officially announced a $25,000 reward for information leading to a conviction in the murder of his son. Asked about this new third probe, Jim told the Times, quote, I really feel that Chad was telling me the truth about what he was doing. I'm upset because nobody paid any attention to what I've been saying for nine months. The Army had closed the case. Now they're investigating it again. What's it going to take to get this squared away? The Army means well, they say they do. But I want this resolved, and I don't know who to trust. End quote. Three months later in March of 1993, the Unsolved Mysteries episode aired for the first time, and the amount of calls they received in regard to Chad's case jammed up lines at the call center. Mary Pat Carney, the telephone coordinator for Unsolved Mysteries, 
said they received nearly 300 tips the night the episode aired, 10 times the number they were prepared for. Many of the callers claimed to have a connection to either the arsenal, the hospital, the local police, or Chad himself. I think it's worth noting that we have to keep in mind many of these callers were anonymous, so how reliable their statements may be is up for debate. One caller, who claimed to work at Fox Army Health Center, where Chad's autopsy was performed, stated that Chad's hands had been handcuffed behind his back when he was found, both of his hands, not just his left, and that the suicide ruling had angered doctors who didn't know how he could have shot himself with his hands bound. Several MPs who claimed to know Chad also called in, saying they'd been ordered not to discuss the case, but they didn't believe it was a suicide. By the time the episode aired, all but one MP Chad had worked with had either left the Army or had been transferred out of the arsenal. A former state trooper in Huntsville told Unsolved Mysteries that the day after Chad's death, the Army had requested that they trace the partial tag number of the vehicle Chad had stopped that night, despite the fact that they would continue to deny that that car existed for months. While we can't really depend on the accuracy of these statements, it is interesting to see how many details about the investigation have been the subject of contradiction and speculation from the position Chad was in when he was found to who may have wanted to see him dead. All tips called in that night were given over to the Army for further investigation, though when they released their third report two months later in May, investigators stated they had found nothing to support the belief that Chad had been murdered. According to this third report, they had reopened the case when they were contacted by a man who claimed that another man, living in Madison County, may have hired a hitman to kill Chad over drugs and money. The tipster claims that the Madison County man tried to hire him to kill his wife, and during the conversation warned him that if he went to authorities, he would do to him what he had done to the soldier at Redstone. Ultimately, the Army determined that the man's tip had no merit, and they ruled out this possibility once again returning to their ruling that Chad had taken his own life. While the Army says the witness failed two polygraph tests, Jim says he was told a different story, explaining, quote, they told me he neither passed or failed either test. They said the tests were inconclusive. So what makes them so sure he didn't do it? End quote. The Army has since said they found no connection between the Madison County man and Chad, nor did they find any evidence that Chad had been involved in the sale or trafficking of any drugs. Curiously, this third report noted that while they believe Chad had taken his own life, they could find no evidence of a history of depression. Once again, they mentioned his struggle with the Army and a history of painful rejections, though Jim wonders why his son was excited to re-enlist if he was so unhappy. While attempting to answer more questions again, new ones were brought to the surface. While initial reports said there was no sign of a struggle and that Chad's uniform wasn't of the appearance that there'd been a physical altercation, this report found that at least two buttons from his uniform were found on the passenger side seat of his car. First, the Army claimed these buttons had been popped off when paramedics arrived to work on Chad. Later, however, they stated their belief that Chad himself had put the buttons there. Disagreeing, Jim believes the buttons confirmed that of a struggle took place, saying, quote, Now they are saying they think either the paramedics picked them up off the ground or that Chad put them there himself. That makes no sense. End quote. In addition to this, Jim told the Times that the Army now believes they have identified the driver of the white car from that night, but they don't believe he was involved in Chad's death. However, this new information also led to a revelation. As it turned out, there was a second car stopped that night. According to the Army, a black vehicle was stopped at a roadblock during the investigation, though again, they don't believe the driver was involved because he'd been at work when the shooting took place. Interestingly, though, anonymous sources from the arsenal told the Times that the driver of this car was named Robert, the name found written on Chad's hand. The Army, however, says this car was stopped approximately 20 minutes after the shooting, and their investigation confirmed that the driver was not in the area when Chad was shot. Despite the discovery of new information, the tipster who led to this third investigation, and the objections of Chad's friends and family, the Army was convinced that suicide was the only determination they could justifiably come to given the evidence at hand. While it may be easy to look at the case individually and determine, one way or the other, 
what you believe is most likely to have occurred, it seemed apparent that the issue with how cases like Chad's were decided was not limited purely to his story. At the core of many of these cases is the use of the psychological autopsies, which seem designed to support a predetermined ruling rather than to determine what actually happened. The same month this third report was issued, the Philadelphia Inquirer ran several articles documenting their discussions with 14 families of service members whose deaths had been ruled suicide, but where the families felt the investigations were either poorly executed or where a leap to suicide was made before all of the evidence was even gathered. Among the cases examined was that of Marine Lieutenant Kirk Vanderbur, whose body was found on the shooting range of the Flatwoods Gun Club in Hubert, North Carolina, on Sunday, February 16th. Despite Vanderbur having been shot twice, once in the stomach and once in the head, with two separate weapons found 10 feet apart, his death was ruled to have been a suicide. According to their report, Vanderbur first shot himself in the stomach with a 12-gauge shotgun. He then dropped that weapon, still loaded, and crawled 8 to 10 feet, picking up his 223 caliber rifle, lifting it to his head and pulling the trigger with his thumb. The sheriff's department ruled it a suicide inside of two days, not even conducting gunpowder residue tests. The psychological autopsy, released nearly a year later, attributed Vanderbur's death to a recent breakup with his girlfriend. The report went on to say that this girlfriend may have told Vanderbur that they had no future together and stated that Vanderbur died seven days before his girlfriend died. The report went on to say Vanderbur committed suicide due to girlfriend issues, money problems, and feelings of inadequacy. There were, however, a couple of issues with this report. Firstly, Vanderbur and his girlfriend had broken up three years earlier, not exactly what most people would define as recent. Second, while the report says his girlfriend died a week later, she's still alive. Thirdly, investigators found Vanderbur had no money issues, no psychological issues, and no history of depression. Two days before his death, he called his mother asking her to send him some of his favorite snacks. The day before, he mailed a letter to his brother giving out a new address where he could be reached on a new assignment. The day of his death, he went sailing with a friend, who he then invited to join him at the range that afternoon. He also called and left a message on his ex-girlfriend's answering machine saying he'd call her later. He left no note, had no alcohol or drugs in his system, and was behaving normally in the weeks leading up to his death, with many saying he was happy and upbeat. Frederick R. McDaniel, a former Army criminal investigator and retired Kansas City police captain, reviewed the case at the request of Vanderbur's family and told the Philadelphia Inquirer, quote, It's a cover-up or incompetence. It's the most blatant dereliction and abuse of duty by any law enforcement agency I've ever seen, end quote. The report included misquoted statements from witnesses, including the owner of the gun range, who said she did not see Vanderbur or his car on the range that night when she left and had a clear view from her office. The report, however, says the owner did not have a clear view and told investigators she didn't check to see if anyone was there something the owner adamantly denies, saying she checks every night. One key detail missing from the official report? Vanderbur stood 5 foot 8 inches tall, and measurements conducted prove that aiming the shotgun into his stomach, he physically could not have reached the trigger. The investigation also leaves several unanswered questions, such as, with Vanderbur being highly familiar with many different firearms, why would he attempt to commit suicide with a shotgun he'd loaded with number 6 birdshot? Why would he do this at a public range in the first place when he had several loaded weapons at home? Ultimately, Vanderbur's cause of death was changed from suicide to self-inflicted, as many believe the shotgun blast had been an accident, possibly due to dropping the weapon. Then there's the case of Army Specialist Terry Wright, whose body was found in a wildlife refuge in Maryland. Wright had died as the result of a single gunshot beneath his chin from a .22 caliber rifle found in his lap. The case was also ruled a suicide, despite several confusing details, such as the fact that there were no marks in the dirt from where the rifle butt should have kicked upon being fired, and in fact, no dirt on the rifle at all. Wright was wearing thick gloves, which did not fit inside the narrow trigger housing of his rifle, and when his body was found, his glasses were still sitting neatly on his nose. 
Wright's death was ruled a suicide, although investigators noted they threw away two uneaten McDonald's takeout meals in his car, did not check with local McDonald's to find anyone who may have seen Wright or someone who was with him that night, did not take fingerprints from the car or the rifle, did not run ballistic tests on the rifle, didn't interview Wright's barracks mates for anyone who had seen him in the hours leading up to his death, didn't canvass the refuge for anyone who may have seen him that day, didn't investigate a second car allegedly seen where Wright's body was found, and threw away Wright's own handwritten notes found in his car. Not to mention, the angle of the gunshot suggests that at the time of the shooting, Wright was pulling his head back, as though he was trying to avoid the barrel, which supports the theory of many that Wright was murdered and the scene was staged to look like a suicide. Despite all of this information, the psychological autopsy conducted in this case attributes Wright's suicide to a breakup with a girlfriend and feeling alone. Regardless of the official ruling, it's worth noting that several members of CID do not believe this was a clear-cut case of suicide, but their commanding officers decided not to contradict the ruling, which was made by the Park Police as they had jurisdiction based upon where Wright's body had been found. Once again, a psychological autopsy here seems designed to support and confirm the official ruling rather than asking any questions or contradicting what's already been decided. On Wednesday, April 19, 1989, the number two 16-inch gun turret aboard the USS Iowa exploded, killing 47 soldiers. Among the dead was gunner's mate Clayton Hartwig. The investigation determined that Hartwig had sabotaged the gun as part of a suicide attempt causing the explosion. A psychological autopsy performed by the FBI for the Navy described Hartwig as an antisocial suicidal loner. Scientific testing, however, conducted in a lab would later determine that the cause of the explosion had nothing to do with Hartwig and that the entire tragic incident had been an accident prompting the Navy to apologize to Hartwig's family for dishonoring his memory by labeling him a suicidal saboteur. Nine months later, a congressional inquiry involving a panel of psychologists harshly criticized the use of psychological autopsies, saying investigators relying on the analysis made false assumptions and sought only evidence to reinforce their preconceived notions about the case. In their finding, the Iowa psychologist panel wrote in part, quote, Psychological autopsies designed to determine suicidal tendencies and behavior are of moderate value and utility. Psychological autopsy is relatively undeveloped with little known about its reliability or validity. We urge exceeding caution in deciding to use posthumous psychological investigations. Many equivocal or unsolved death cases may simply have to remain unsolved. End quote. In a follow-up to their expose, the Philadelphia Inquirer interviewed the families of 40 service members whose deaths had been ruled suicide despite contradictory evidence. Four former military investigators were brought in to review the cases and found that, in the ones in which psychological autopsies were used, they were never valuable tools and seemed to exist simply to deliver reasoning behind a suicide ruling, even if there was no reasoning. Ronald F. Decker, a former Air Force criminal investigator, referred to the psychological autopsy in one case with a simple-to-understand two-word analysis, calling it total bullshit. Among the 40 cases examined was the death of Chad Langford. James W. Keefe, a former CID investigator, reviewed all of the reports and files for the Inquirer and stated his belief that the evidence simply does not support a ruling of suicide, saying, quote, it smells bad. It appears that the cause of death and the manner of death were a foregone conclusion. This is highly irregular. End quote. Keefe went on to state that the report suggested that investigators made a very minor effort to identify the driver of the white car the night Chad was killed, despite the gates to the arsenal being ordered locked after Chad's body was found. Evidence analysis related to Chad's gun showed that no additional attempts had been made to identify the white residue found near the trigger. Interestingly, experts in suicide analysis noted that there was no blood or brain matter found on or in Chad's gun, which is highly unusual in a case where someone allegedly held the weapon to their own head. Examining the psychological autopsy, Keefe was less than impressed. While the Army had, by this point, admitted that they could not find a history of depression or psychological issues, 
could not conclusively determine whether or not Chad had fired a gun, why he would have fired it twice, why it was found beneath his body, why his prints weren't on the weapon, and why unidentified prints were found on several items at the scene, the autopsy goes on to speculate without any evidence, saying Chad, quote, was determined to kill himself in a fashion that would suggest he had been murdered in the line of duty, end quote. The report goes on to allege that Chad had a recurrent major depression and displayed narcissistic and obsessive compulsive traits, though it never actually provides evidence to support either of those statements. Asked his professional investigative opinion of the psychological autopsy, Keefe described the report to the Inquirer as, quote, the biggest bunch of crap I've ever read. They assume suicide, then they tried to build a case for it and bend the facts to fit it, end quote. Unfortunately, 29 years later, despite all of the discrepancies raised and questions left unanswered, the death of Chad Langford remains classified as a suicide, and there has been no additional investigation, analysis of evidence, or examination since the mid-1990s, leaving a grieving family without the truth they seek and feeling that the memory of their beloved son, grandson, and cousin has been marred by investigators who decided he had to have taken his own life before they'd even received a single result from the lab. Chad Wayne Langford wanted to enlist in the military for years. It was a dream of his to serve his country to protect those he loved. For three years, he served with honor, being awarded commendations and the Good Conduct Medal. He was described as a model soldier, someone who was going somewhere and had potential. Then, in the summer of 1991, he transfers to Alabama to become a military police officer at the Redstone Arsenal. While Chad told friends and relatives of his undercover work in drug operations, the Army claims he was turning into a troubled young man who began hanging out with the wrong crowd, planning robberies, and acquiring guns. Despite this, there were no negative marks on Chad's file, no disciplinary actions needed to be taken, and those who allegedly planned out a robbery with him never faced charges for their role in the planning a story which didn't come out until after Chad was gone and could no longer stand up for himself. While friends and loved ones describe a polite, kind, and loving man with an optimism about the future and a plan to re-enlist, the Army describes a depressive person with narcissistic tendencies and a growing distaste for military life. Of course, given their history with psychological autopsies, it's somewhat difficult to know what from their analysis is right since so much of it in Chad's case has been proven wrong or inaccurate. Either way, Chad is gone. 20 years old with a bright future filled with possibilities, he was cut down in his prime on a dark, chilly night. Yet what happened on March 12, 1992 has never fully been explained. Chad's family believes the soldier was murdered, either due to his involvement as an undercover officer or perhaps by someone who was angry and wanted to lash out at the soldier, perhaps even someone stationed at the base. For the Army, they believe Chad went above and beyond to stage a scene which would make it appear as though he was killed in the line of duty, dying a hero rather than having taken his own life. Of course, they also assume that he believed no one would investigate this. The truth, it seems, lies somewhere in between. Despite the loss of his son and his strong feelings that the army, at best, was incompetent in the investigation, or at worst, actively worked to cover up what happened, Jim Langford has never given up hope that the truth will someday come to light and his son's memory will be cleaned of this dark mark. Nine months after his death, Jim arrived in Alabama and stood at the spot where his son had breathed his last breaths. Asked about this difficult and painful visit, Jim explained how it only made his search for truth stronger, saying, quote, It was pretty traumatic to go to that spot, and I always knew it would be. I had to get up the courage to do it. But while I was standing on that spot, I got this overwhelming feeling that he wanted me to be there. It felt good, like I was standing there with him and I was doing what he wanted me to do. The death of Chad Langford is one of those cases that's always stuck with me for two reasons. 
Being the son of a military veteran, I have a lot of respect for those who have the courage and drive to enlist. The second being, I remember seeing Chad's segment on Unsolved Mysteries, something I always watched back then even though it scared the hell out of me when I was 11 years old. I remember at the time wondering why the death of a soldier seemed to get dismissed so quickly. You'd think that the army would want to get it right. They'd want to ensure they covered every detail, and yet even a cursory examination of Chad's death raises a lot of questions that have never been answered. Chad's case is one that, while it was covered thoroughly in the years following his death, it's essentially fallen into silence in the more than two decades that have passed since. Whether that's the result of the army refusing to budge, a lack of available evidence, witnesses who haven't spoken up, or something else is beyond my ability to determine, but it's incredibly frustrating either way. Whenever someone's child enlists in the military, they know in the back of their mind that there's a chance they won't be coming home alive. However, when your son is stationed at one of the country's most secure bases and dies on duty, that's obviously something that's difficult to accept. Confronted by the evidence in this case, Jim Langford justifiably had the greatest difficulty accepting his son's death being the result of a suicide rather than foul play. Sadly, deaths in the military are often overlooked and swept under the rug despite the arguments of friends, family, and sometimes even the investigators working the cases. Whether the military wants to avoid bad press or perhaps wants to just move things along as quickly as possible is something I've never fully understood. All you have to do is look into non-combat-related soldier deaths, sexual assaults, and other attacks, and it isn't hard to see there's a lot of stories you're simply not hearing. According to the Congressional Research Service, 74% of all active-duty U.S. military deaths between 2006 and 2020 didn't occur on the battlefield, but rather in places with no active conflict. Of that 74%, 93% of those deaths happened within the United States. Excluding 2021, that accounts for 913 non-combat-related deaths every day. Yes, not every month or week, every day. That means that just in the time you've listened to this episode, on average, at least two soldiers have died of non-combat injuries inside of the United States. 31.8% of these deaths are attributed to accidents, while 24% are ruled to have been the result of self-inflicted injuries. In the years since September 11, 2001, 30,177 active-duty soldiers and veterans have died as the result of suicide, versus 7,057 who were killed in active combat over the same time period. Now, I don't have the information nor the education to determine what's causing so many soldiers to die at their own hands, though I'd imagine psychological issues related to depression and post-traumatic stress disorder are involved. It's really a disturbing and heartbreaking trend which, despite the knowledge of it, only seems to continue with steps taken to decrease the risk seemingly failing across the board. I suppose the question that springs to mind would be, of those whose deaths were ruled suicide, how many have conflicting evidence, alternate theories, and flawed psychological autopsies in their reports? Turning back to the case at hand, the death of Chad Langford, it comes down to what you believe. Was the Army accurate in its assessment that Chad was troubled, had recurrent major depressive episodes, was veering into a criminal lifestyle and lying about his supposed work as an undercover drug officer in order to make those in his life view him as being more important, or was Chad's death ruled a suicide early on, and rather than changing that determination, the evidence, the psychology, and the story were all shaped to fit a narrative which has been used frequently despite the arguments of those connected to these cases? The best way to go about this, I think, is to take both theories at the same time and move through everything point by point. I don't believe I'm in any position to decide what happened here. I don't believe anyone really is other than a trained investigator with both military and forensic knowledge. That being said, theory analysis will be more about what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, and whether or not the investigations into Chad's death were conducted from an unbiased perspective or if it was all about towing the line and supporting a predetermined outcome. Being that there's so much information, I'd rather handle it in sections rather than all at once, so we'll begin with Chad's background. We don't know a lot about his life prior to the Army, but what we do know certainly doesn't seem to display a troubled, depressed, and criminally active young man. Chad grew up in Elk Creek and attended a small high school where he played football and baseball. 
No one from Chad's past has ever spoken about him struggling with any issues, be they depression or otherwise. And in fact, almost everyone from Chad's past described a vibrant, upbeat, and life-loving person. He performed well academically and on the field, ultimately deciding to join the military, which had connections to members of his own family. Enlisting in 1989 at the age of 18, Chad completes basic training and is sent to South Korea, where he stays for several years. During this time, he earns multiple commendations and the Good Conduct Medal. He achieves the rank of E-4 Specialist and ultimately is put in charge of a platoon in overseeing their training and duty. He's described as a model soldier, and it's believed that he has great potential with a future in the military. Up until 1991, when he's transferred to Alabama. But prior to that, there's no record of Chad having caused any problems or facing any kind of disciplinary action. Assumably, during this time, Chad wasn't involved in anything that would call into question his dedication to his duty, his mental state, or his involvement in any seedy activities. In January of 1992, Chad contacts his father, among others, and tells them that he's been working an undercover operation as a drug officer focused in on the neighborhood surrounding the Redstone Arsenal. Initially, this seems like something he enjoys, but as time goes on, he begins to discuss his concerns about his identity being revealed and the harm that could come to him should that occur. The next month in February, he breaks up with his fiancée, Roxanne, allegedly telling her he has to do it because of his job. The two had only been together for three and a half months. Chad proposed to Roxanne one month into their relationship and she turned him down. But when he asked two months later, she accepted, under the agreement that they move forward slowly and not just rush to the altar. One night, they go shopping for engagement rings, and the next day, Chad tells her she has to leave, things are over, and while he doesn't want to do this, it's necessary for his job. Over the course of the next weeks, he begins hanging out with questionable people, wearing black and dark-colored clothing, gets his ear pierced, and purchases three guns, two handguns and a rifle. The army will chalk this up as a sign that Chad was behaving badly, trying to fit him with his new criminal friends, while his family would argue he was doing this to fit him with his undercover operation. To me, it almost sounds like the satanic panic of the 80s. Chad's dressing differently and got his ear pierced. He must be up to some really bad stuff, even though he's never arrested, charged, or involved in any illegal activities as far as the army knows. The Huntsville police apparently questioned Chad about a string of car break-ins, because they found him sitting in a parked car with a rifle in the back seat. The army utilizes this information to suggest he may have been involved, though they never provide evidence of any crimes, nor did the Huntsville PD call him a suspect. Throughout his entire life, Chad's never arrested for anything, nor did he have any kind of a record. The army themselves acknowledge they could find no link between him and any drug trafficking, sales, or any kind of illegal activity, So why does it seem like they're so quick to say he was involved in things even though they can't prove it? That'll become a through line throughout most of their investigation. Was this done to make his reputation fit their narrative? Or is this the result of interviews with fellow soldiers who may or may not have wanted to say good and or bad things about Chad? Then we get this weird story of how Chad was plotting to rob $30,000 from an army escort with the assistance of another MP and two soldiers on the base. Reportedly, Chad planned to have the escort shot, and he too would be shot while wearing a bulletproof vest in order to make a good cover story. This never happens, but following his death, the MP and soldiers tell investigators all about it, and I can't help but ask, why? If you were in on it, why the hell are you even bringing it up, especially since it never happened? Also, if you bring it up and say you were involved, how the hell does the army not have enough evidence to charge you or investigate further? It's like me saying, I'm going to shoot someone, and the police being like, oh, only if we had more information we could do something about this. It's ridiculous. Of course, despite all of this, the army doesn't feel that the three people who were allegedly going to be involved in a murder and robbery could possibly have been involved in the death of their supposed ringleader, right? So, I think the obvious question here is, was Chad really working undercover, or was the army correct in saying it was a story he made up to make himself seem more important? The truth is, we have no way of knowing. Chad's family doesn't believe he'd lie about it, neither do his friends, some of who say they saw threatening letters that he'd received. Multiple people say Chad told them he'd been shot at while driving on the interstate, while others have said that alleged gang members gave him trouble at the enlisted members club. 
These are not mutually exclusive concepts, as Chad could have been threatened for any number of reasons outside of his alleged undercover work. I'm in no position to say yes or no one way or the other, but there's a few things that have been bothering me. Firstly, Chad had been an MP for just nine months, which seems fairly early to put someone into dangerous undercover work. Not saying it's not possible, but if that's a legit procedure, then someone needs to change it. Secondly, and to me most importantly, I find it very difficult to believe that Chad would be working undercover in areas surrounding the base, but would simultaneously be scheduled to work his patrol duties in uniform on the base. The chances of being seen, identified, and found out are astronomical under those circumstances, and it simply makes no sense. You don't see undercover detectives in the police department also working in uniform as traffic cops within blocks of where they do their covert operations. The Army says there's no official records that designate Chad as performing any undercover duties, and while I find believing their information to be a losing gamble in most cases, I really don't doubt this. What I wonder, though, is whether or not it's possible that Chad was working off the books for someone, maybe a higher-ranking officer or a local police department. In episode 15, we covered the case of Andrew Sadek, a student who was roped into being a confidential informant after being caught purchasing drugs. Could something like this have happened to Chad? I certainly think it's possible. Would he have been willing to do it and keep it off the books in order to keep his service record clean? Well, if he planned to re-enlist, then yeah, I'd say there's a pretty good chance. But what if it's none of those? You've got to remember that 1992 is not far from the era of the Medellin cartel flying drugs in through Mina Airport in Arkansas and through different methods. Regardless of what you believe about that scenario, many have raised questions linking military and intelligence officials to these operations. So is it possible that Chad could have been told by a supervising officer that he was going to be involved in these operations and no one could know about them? It's certainly plausible, depending on how far you could stretch things out. But I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility to acknowledge there are criminal elements operating their own corrupt plans inside of many facets of our society, be it law enforcement, military, or intelligence agencies. Some people believe that Chad was working undercover, but not targeting those in the surrounding area. Instead, the theory has been posited that Chad could have been working to uncover criminal activities being conducted by other members of the military police. Were this the case, then yeah. You'd want him on duty working his normal patrols so that he blended in with everyone else. Perhaps his disguise was the uniform he wore every day, supported by the people he spent time with and his new off-duty style. Considering at least one MP acknowledged knowing about the alleged robbery plot and never went to authorities prior to Chad's death, I'd say there may have been good reason to be investigating these people. Unfortunately, there's really no way of knowing what exactly was going on here. But doesn't it seem strange that someone working undercover would tell his father, friends, and fiancé of how dangerous it was, while at the same time inviting women to come visit him while he was in uniform and on patrol? Honestly, if you could prove the truth of this to me, I'd be inclined to believe it. But if you could show beyond the shadow of a doubt that Chad was not working undercover, I wouldn't be surprised there either. The military has a hell of a way of compartmentalizing things, so it wouldn't be shocking to find out that a soldier who thought he was doing one thing in all reality was being guided in a completely different direction. Sadly, I don't think we're ever going to know the answer to this question, so let's move on to the night of Chad's death and what evidence we know for sure. Chad came on duty on the afternoon of Thursday, March 12th. For the first few hours of his shift, he had a partner in his cruiser. After 6 p.m., Chad is on his own and heads back out on patrol. According to an MP present in the station, Chad is directly told to avoid the southern edges of the bases near the recreational area. This is said to be because should something happen, backup wouldn't be able to get there rapidly. Just out of curiosity, how does this make any sense? Do military installations frequently leave large areas of their bases unprotected because backup can't get there quickly? Also, if that's true, Then why is it that Chad's final radio transmission comes in at 8.07 and his body's found at 8.20? They had no idea where he was, but it took them just 13 minutes to find him? In fact, it doesn't even take 13 minutes. He lasts radios at 8.07, but MPs aren't sent to look for him until he fails to call back in or answer in his cruiser. 
How much time passed there? One, two, three minutes? Let's be charitable and say three minutes. They decide to look for Chad. That means it takes 10 minutes or less to locate him when they have no idea where he is. 10 minutes of driving to the wreck area and then going all around to ultimately find him on a side road. It doesn't really sound like backup would have been that far out of reach, but I digress. So why does Chad go there in the first place? The most rational explanation seems to be one of two possibilities. Either he was planning to meet someone there or he knew there was a payphone there and he could use it. Chad radios in that he's at the rec center, and according to all reports, it doesn't sound like anyone responds by saying, uh, you know, you were told not to go there, so why are you there? You disobeyed an order, get back to the station. Just seems strange to me. We know Chad made several calls. He called a girl at Alabama A&M and asked her to visit him. She initially agrees, but then something else comes up. He calls another girl at the school and makes plans to get together with her that night. He calls his ex-fiance and leaves her a message, and he calls a friend and fellow soldier to check in on him and to make plans to get together at a later date. At 8.07, he radios the station and says he's going to investigate a stalled vehicle nearby the recreational area. He doesn't give any description, tag numbers, or a description of the occupants. The Army would argue no car was there, and Chad was making this up to buy himself time to stage the scene. Were that the case... Wouldn't he know that his failure to give additional information would result in MPs being sent to find him? That would severely limit his window of time. I imagine he could have given a different reason, which may have bought him more time, but he doesn't, for whatever reason. Now, depending on who you believe, this is Chad's last transmission. Other MPs, however, have said they believe Chad tried using his radio again, but all that came across was garbled static. This isn't in the official report because the dispatcher didn't hear this second call, so from the Army's point of view, it never happened. What's interesting is the dispatcher left the station to go and look for Chad along with other MPs, so couldn't this transmission have occurred when he wasn't in earshot of the radio? Hard to say, but considering that Chad's radio mic was hanging out of his car, it's rather curious that this wasn't investigated further. At the scene, the first MP describes finding Chad lying on the ground and bleeding from a wound to his head. His ankles are tied with a cord, which is used to attach his gun to his uniform. The Army will later say this tie was loose. A wire from his radar units wrapped around his neck, and again, according to the Army, it's done loosely. There's a handcuff on his left wrist, but his right is free, yet the keys are clutched in his left hand. In addition to this, his cap is folded and stuffed in his mouth and two buttons from his uniform are lying on the passenger seat. His radio, MP armband, and ID badge are found in the street a quarter mile away, neatly arranged. Coming from the Army's point of view, with this being a conscious act planned out by Chad for months, what the hell is the purpose of leaving his equipment in the street? If he wants you to believe he was murdered, this seems rather antithetical to that approach. Forensic examination finds unidentified finger and palm prints as well as unknown fibers on these items. While this could easily make you believe someone else must have done it, the Army disagrees and only compares the prints to Chad and the first MP on the scene. To this day, those prints remain unidentified, and apparently for an outfit allegedly as thorough as the Army, this doesn't bother them enough to warrant further investigation. When paramedics begin working on Chad, they find two shell casings and his own army-issued 45 caliber handgun beneath his body. Now, I know a lot of people consider the gun being under his body as some kind of earth-shattering evidence that proves he could not have shot himself, but there's many examples of confirmed suicides in which the victim's weapon is found beneath them, so I don't put a lot of stock into that. Bodies and weapons do weird things when someone collapses from being shot, and I don't think it's entirely impossible to believe that the gun hit the ground an instant before Chad did. Chad gets rushed to the hospital and sadly dies on the operating table. So what do you think would be the most likely thing to do next? Well, you want to run ballistics on his gun to confirm the two shells found came from it. To their credit, the Army does this, and yes, those shells were from Chad's forty-five. However, They don't run any tests to determine if the gun was the murder weapon, nor do they have an explanation as to why two shots were fired. I know they say that Chad fired one shot before shooting himself in order to make it seem like a homicide, but that's not evidence, that's speculation. It's like saying he fired the first shot because he was angry at a tree he saw in the woods. Sure, it can explain the two shots, but there's no evidence to support that statement. 
And when you factor in that they never found either bullet, the first shot, or the one that killed Chad, it becomes quite clear that this explanation is meritless. Next, they protect Chad's hands and run gunpowder residue tests to determine whether or not he was in fact the one who fired his gun. These tests are not able to conclusively prove that Chad fired any gun that night, let alone twice. The only way this could have happened would be if somehow when he fired his gun, a very small amount of gunpowder residue was deposited on his hands or someone else fired the gun. Gunpowder residue, unfortunately, is a rather controversial topic, and it isn't really worth getting into a debate other than to say, sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. There's a lot of factors involved, from wind to cleanliness of the gun and the type of ammunition used. I'd like to know if the Army test-fired Chad's gun and then did additional testing to find out if the test shooter's hands had residue on them or not, but this doesn't appear to have happened. According to the pathologist, the bullet that killed Chad entered his head at a slightly upward angle and had to have been fired from a height of no more than 30 inches off the ground. To them, this suggests that Chad knelt down before pulling the trigger as, from that angle, another shooter would have had to have been lying on the ground when the gun was fired. The autopsy report says the shot was fired from point-blank range, though there's no mention of powder burns or gunshot residue being on Chad's head or scalp. Examination of the gun shows no blowback, an action which occurs when a gun is fired in suicides where the barrel is up against the victim's head. The gun will often draw in materials, typically blood and brain matter, when fired at close range. In Chad's case, however, his gun has no blood or brain matter on it, and the only unidentified evidence is white residue found near the trigger. So what's the argument here? That Chad fired the gun at himself, but he didn't hold it up to his head, instead letting the barrel linger a few inches away from his temple? Surely that's possible, but it's a strange way to ensure the gunshot's going to hit where you want it to. Maybe this is part of the Army's argument that he planned this out for months, or maybe it's one of those details that just don't make sense. I also struggle with the argument that if there was a different shooter, he had to be lying on the ground to get that shot off while simultaneously saying Chad could have done this from his knees. Isn't it possible another shooter in a struggle with Chad, perhaps in the midst of tying him up, was also down on his knees when he fired the lethal shot? To say the shooter had to be lying down directly contradicts their own account of how they believe Chad was positioned when he allegedly shot himself. Again, another situation where the army report is based in speculation rather than fact. Then we have unconfirmed reports from a series of anonymous sources, from hospital employees to anonymous MPs, that upon arriving, Chad's hands were both cuffed behind his back. Now, we have no way of knowing this for certain, and from what I understand, the crime scene photos have never been released. Was this rumor, speculation, or did these witnesses actually see this? Sadly, unless someone's willing to come forward on the record, it's an area we can't really entertain much debate about. So, let's look at something a little different for a second. When a police officer is shot, investigators pull out all the stops. They call in all available units, they contact neighboring departments, they send out information across the state and surrounding states that they're in search of a potential shooter. This is because you're not supposed to assume suicide at the crime scene and ignore any other possibility. You want to make sure if someone was involved, you find them. That didn't happen here. They locked down the base, sure, but they didn't contact the Huntsville police or any neighboring law enforcement agencies. They didn't launch any kind of a manhunt or put the word out to be on the lookout for a suspicious vehicle, anyone with a gun, anyone in the area who seemed to be up to no good. If indeed someone else was involved, they were pretty much allowed to walk away. Then we get the white car that gets stopped. Less than 10 minutes after an MP is fatally wounded, you stop a car within two miles of the scene and you don't even write down the driver's name or a description of his vehicle. Instead, they take his ID badge and hold it at the MP station where the next day he's allowed to pick it up without any questions asked. Talk about your half-assed investigations. I get more questions in a routine traffic stop than these guys ask in the minutes following a shooting. One MP says the guy works at a local Taco Bell. Another says Chad had gone to that Taco Bell looking for someone who owed him money, and what does the army say? Well, first they say this car never existed. Then they say they can't find the guy. Later they say, all right, we found him, but he wasn't involved. Based on what investigation were you able to determine he wasn't involved? Did they simply ask him, and when he said no, they were like, well, that's good enough for me? Then there's the black car that gets stopped apparently 20 or so minutes after the shooting. 
This person comes upon a roadblock and much like the previous car apparently isn't questioned very much and is allowed to just go about his business. But the army claims they confirmed he was at work at the time of the shooting, so he couldn't have been involved. How they confirmed any of this? Well, they don't think that's pertinent enough to share. We also have an anonymous MP who claims the driver's name was Robert. You know, the name written on Chad's hand. Nah, it couldn't be anything to that. Speaking of the writing on Chad's hand, we've never gotten an explanation. Mar-03 and Robert or Roberta? Could Mar-03 be part of a license plate? Could it be a reference to nine days earlier, March 3rd? Could it be some kind of code? Well, we don't know, and apparently no one else has really put in the time or effort to figure anything out about it. Factor that in with the weird words and potential phone numbers from his legal pad, and you've got a whole nother mystery right here, but one that no one has broken a sweat trying to solve. Just for the record, I'd like to note, I ran both of the potential numbers through my system with the Northern Alabama area code attached and both led to landline telephones. Doesn't necessarily mean those numbers are still assigned to the same places as they were in 1992, but that would have been an avenue I'd have looked at were I investigating this case back then. So what do you really have here, if you're perfectly upfront with the evidence? A dead soldier who is shot in the head at point-blank range. His sidearm has been fired twice and is found under his body, but gunpowder residue tests can't prove he fired the weapon. He's bound to some degree and lying on the ground while the door to his car hangs open with the radio mic dangling. A quarter mile away, his badge, radio, and armband are found with unidentified prints and a strange message written on his hand goes unexplained. To me, if I were walking into this scene to investigate, my first thought would be that foul play probably happened here, yet for the army, it just seems like an obvious suicide, and that's how they write it up. In their so-called psychological autopsy, they report that Chad is depressed and displayed narcissistic traits and obsessive-compulsive behaviors. They don't actually supply evidence to support those conclusions. They just say them, and I guess we're supposed to believe them. Where they do supply evidence, it's almost entirely wrong. They say Chad's despondent because his girlfriend refused to marry him and broke up with him when in fact she did agree to marry him and he broke up with her. He was also seeing two other women. So what? He was so upset about leaving his ex that while dating two women at the same time, he decided rather than getting back together with Roxanne, he should just end it all? In what world does that make any sense? The report simultaneously says Chad experienced recurring major depressive events and that they found no history of depression or psychological issues. Excuse me? How does one fit along with the other? That's like saying someone has an anger management problem but has never displayed anger or violence. Oh, by the way, I should mention this because it's pretty important. So these psychological autopsies aren't carried out the way I bet you're thinking. You know, the psychologist calls the family and friends, asks pertinent questions to establish a mental behavioral pattern for Chad, looks over his writings and army record in search of any red flags or signs of trouble that could have been coming. No, no. See, the way this is done, army investigators interview everyone. Then they supply reports of those interviews which the psychologist analyzes to come to his conclusions. So, rather than someone trained in psychology who will know what questions are important to ask, it's doled out to people who are simply asking questions from an investigative perspective, not a psychological one. Not to mention, merely working off transcripts, how the hell can you adjust for tone, sarcasm, humor, etc.? It would be like hiring a therapist and then talking to your friend who goes and meets with your therapist and relates what you said in order to diagnose you. How accurate is that going to be? So you've got evidence that doesn't line up and a psychoanalysis that on its best day might be on par with Lucy Van Pelt's five cent psychiatric business. Then you've got to factor in this psychological analysis isn't done until weeks after Chad's death, at which time you're going to tell me that this person was working to get to the truth of the matter rather than seeking out information which could help shore up a decision the army had already made about Chad's cause of death. If you can believe that, then I've got a ton of bridges I'd like to sell you. Imagine someone believing the complex working of the mind could be summed up by people mentioning simple things like, oh, he was sad one day because his dog died, and another time he was sad because he lost his watch. Well, you just cross out dog and watch, and now you've got a history of downtrodden feelings and you're on your way to reconstructing the psychology of someone you've never even met. There is so much to this case we could analyze it endlessly, but it's really not going to bring us any closer to the truth. 
The fact of the matter is, this should never have been ruled a suicide, nor should it have been ruled a homicide. This, at best, is a situation where the cause of death should have been filed as undetermined. There is not enough evidence one way or the other to come to a direct conclusion without further investigation. Oh, and for the record, while the Army's death certificate does list Chad's cause of death as suicide, his civilian death certificate lists it as undetermined. So at least one person here knows what the fuck they're doing. Chad Langford had a bright future. He joined the army to be a part of something he'd always dreamed of, and up or down, good or bad, he performed his duties well enough to earn awards, commendations, and promotions with nothing tarnishing his record. Up until the day of his death, he was considered a model soldier, and yet in the aftermath, he suddenly becomes this dark figure who's up to no good and clearly planned this out in advance. He was so smart and planned this so thoroughly that he created a scene so unconvincing that the army determined it was a suicide within 48 hours. The army believes Chad was looking for a way out, though they can't really tell you why. Every reason they have given has been dismissed. Chad didn't hate the army. He was going to re-enlist. He wasn't devastated over being dumped. He was the one who ended things. He didn't have no one to talk to. He made at least four calls the night of his death. Yet he didn't call the two most important people in his life, his father and his grandmother. Somehow, it was more important to speak to two women he'd been seeing on and off for a few weeks because that makes perfect sense, just like this whole case. The sad truth is, we will likely never know exactly what happened that night. Chad's death will remain shrouded in mystery in large part because of a shoddy rushed investigation, a lack of drive to pursue any alternative theories that call the army's ruling into question, and a series of confusing evidence which could point in one direction or the other, but which has never been analyzed or investigated enough to shed any light on what is an extremely dark day for the army and Chad's family. Unfortunately, without the discovery of new information, a thorough and dedicated investigation, or people coming forward with what they know, the death of Chad Langford will continue to be classified as a suicide. This case is not cold as far as the army is concerned. It's closed. If you're looking for more information about the mysterious death of Chad Langford, the Huntsville Times and Aniston Star have done the most thorough coverage. You can also find Chad's case featured on Unsolved Mysteries. If you have any information about the death of Chad Langford, please contact the Army Military Police by calling 1-844-ARMY-CID or by sending an email to army.cid.crime.tips at mail.mil. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at traceevpod. Message me on Instagram at traceevidencepod, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. Today's episode dealt with discussions involving suicide, a very tragic and disturbing situation affecting many families out there today. If you or someone you love is suffering from suicidal ideation, please reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. You can also visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org where there are chat and text options for those who don't wish to speak on the phone or those who are hard of hearing. Trace evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine, Anne Bertram, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Buttram, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eloanne Meyer, Eric Sumter, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jen Treb. Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkwitz, Julie Mangano, Cara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B, 
Marla Wright, Melissa Brakaisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Janssen, Sarah Levinen, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Adorable Susie Summers, Taylor, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace-evidence.com and click on the support option. Originally, this week's episode was meant to come out last week, but I suffered some technical issues that caused me to delay, so I apologize for that inconvenience. I want to thank you again for listening to this episode. And I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.